Perfect. So I know you had forwarded through quite a lot in terms of reflections on your your trajectory and your thoughts on the specialty as it's advanced. And you know, we'd spoken a good bit about the dreams of the founders and where you thought things were um, in, in the minds of folks on that first generation. I wanted to ask you a couple questions. I know in terms of characterizing this group of folks who came out of the early transition period, so that 1967, 68, 69, um, where the specialty was starting to be defined, um, and you had listed a whole lot of founders and leaders from that period. What was your yeah. what was your perspective on the the first cohort of students and residents that kind of came through in the first couple of uh, days uh, uh, and years of this? And the, the reason I bring that up is Bob Taylor had mentioned he felt like those were the most courageous souls in this process because they're the ones that had to take the plunge into something they believed in, um, but didn't have necessarily a track record behind it. Do you have any thoughts or perspectives on, on that group of, of young leaders that were coming out in the, the early days? Well, I, I reflect, I reflect a lot on the, the, the tenor of the sixties. Uh, it was a time of change and people, young people were, eager to participate in, uh, in, a, in a movement that indicated that uh, the old wasn't working, we had to try the new. It's almost like what we're going through today, actually. Um, and uh, when you think about uh, any, any person who decides they want to become a physician, uh, you, you can't help it. it you know, it's, it sounds trite. But in uh, almost every application or uh, personal statement that I get from residents, the reason why I went into medicine is because I care about people. Well, who doesn't really care about people? You almost <laughs> have to be mentally ill not to care about another person. But but I know what that means. I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's the enjoyment of having the opportunity to engage in a person's life in a meaningful way over long periods of time. And our specialty uh, uh, resonates in terms of its philosophy, it resonates with a lot of people going into medicine. Just fundamentally, uh, you know, the, this whole concept of providing holistic care, comprehensiveness of care, con continuous relationships to the patients over time, that, that has great appeal to young people going into medicine. It continues to be appealing to most of us. You know, I, I think uh, that uh, when we start, when we were when we were uh, promoting the, the 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 philosophy of family medicine, uh, it was it was easy to do because it was something that. Um, the medical students responded to so quickly. I mean, the, when you say this to a young person or a, a young, yeah, a young person in medical school is considering a career choice, and that you are a specialty that has a relationship with the patients from the beginning of life to the end of life, and you and you are involved in providing uh, care for the vast majority of the problems, whether they're medical illnesses or disturbances in their health, however they're perceived, uh, and you can engage in people's lives in such a meaningful way to help them deal with that that illness or that disturbance, it just has a lot of, uh, it, it just means a lot to, to a young person thinking of a career. Now, uh, it's easy too to think in the same way when you're thinking about specialty choice. I mean, if you get really excited about sports medicine or orthopedics or get excited about a role model that happened to be a cardiologist who's taking care of people who were critically ill and you were seeing the difference that they made in people's lives, that too could make a big difference in career choice. Hmm. But basically we were talking to, when people were, when we had the opportunity to talk about our specialty, it was something, oh, this is what I always wanted to do, and I start thinking about becoming a doctor. Now, so you, you think early on then, those those first, maybe so those first five years, 
um, talking to students and residents that it was an easy, uh, almost, I don't want to say advertisement, pr promotion was the word that you used. It was easy to promote simply because you had this uh, cultural revolution in which people were seeing the world differently at this time period, and family medicine complemented a little bit of those ideals in that way. That's what I'm hearing from you between Well, yeah, time. it does that, and I, and I can tell you, the people who who were... Yeah, when I when I started out in 1969 as a program director, I was the youngest program director in the country at the time. Wow! How old were you? Uh, you mind asking? Well, at that time in 1969, I was 19, I was 33 years old. Wow! Uh, I I was fresh out of my fellowship. Uh, the specialty was just established, and when I went to meetings, uh, it was people who were. Uh, already have been in practice for a number of years who are becoming program directors. Now, guys like Tom Wolf up in Syracuse yep. uh, was in the military at the time. And uh, he was a resident, and he obviously was very excited about becoming involved in an academic way. So he was another young youngster. Uh, but And he became a, and eventually did become a program director. Uh, but uh, the program directors who were already in place at the time, among those first 15 pilot programs, they were all old timers. You take a guy like, uh, 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 Tom, uh, the Tom. guy from New York. Tom, uh, not Tom Lehman. Tom Lehman was, was another Pensley. one of those yeah. kind of people. Um, he'll come to me, uh, but at any rate, uh, they were, these guys, uh, were, I would say, enthusiastic hmm. about what they've been doing with their lives for so many years as general practitioners. And, and they were eager to share their experience and help mold some of these young people into this new specialty, which they endorse wholeheartedly. They recognize what we were trying to do made so much sense. And it's to take a, you know, in the old days, you, you went from an internship right into practice. Yep. Uh, and and starting in, in 1969, we had this three-year residency program. Some wondered whether it was really necessary. Uh, the, the Canadians were still doing a two-year program for their general practitioners. Even Ian McGuinney at that time was, who was uh, obviously one of the mentors for all of us. Uh, he, he was uh, in charge of a two-year residency program up there in Canada. Uh, but we wanted to go the three-year route and uh, it made a lot of sense from my point of view what we were trying to accomplish with the people trying to acquire uh, the, the added skill levels that were now so available to us because specialization had also provided a lot of sophisticated uh, people in the specialties, whether they were cardiologists or orthopedic surgeons or, or pulmonary people, et cetera, et cetera, pediatricians. And they had a lot to offer us. And we just had, they had, we had to structure a program to make it possible for us to interact with these individuals over time. So, so and it worked, it worked beautifully. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. And you said how it worked beautifully and, and certainly as, well, as the, well, yeah, I, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, so specifically as, as this structure and you use the term like the structure was building up and you had these enthusiastic leaders and you're promoting the profession and things started to work beautifully in that first decade or two can you recall any achievements that the specialty oh, well, made that really stuck out for you well i can tell you it worked beautifully but it wasn't without some strain, <laughs> strain. uh I'll give you an example okay. i mean when when we uh approach the dermatologists to be our mentors in teaching residents in family medicine, dermatology. A lot of the bread and butter dermatology uh, was pretty simple. And they they were not they were they were a bit they, some of them felt a bit threatened about uh, uh, teaching
leading us to take their business, taking business away from them. Interesting. Uh, but what proved, what we proved over time is, first of all, dermatologists can't take care of all the skin problems that are out there. Uh, there are long waiting waiting lists in Lancaster County to even see a dermatologist unless it's an urgent problem. So uh, we never really affected their pocketbooks. If anything, we became more sophisticated in identifying uh, dermatologic problems that required referral. And so as many problems we might have been able to take away from them, that is issues that we were now qualified to care for, we were also making additional referrals that they may not have received before early at the early stages, for example, in people who might have melanomas and so forth. And they were, it, it balanced out very nicely. And, and as, my, as a matter of fact, in my opinion, it's turned out to be in their favor. Interesting. Uh, and likewise, you can take uh, orthopedic problems. Uh, there's so many people out there with back issues and, and, uh, and all kinds of musculoskeletal complaints, whether it's rheumatologic or whatever, uh, we uh, we become more sophisticated in our diagnosis, our ability to develop diagnosis, and more sophisticated in our ability to make referrals. And of course, the payment system has changed dramatically. The, the payment system has made it very easy, much more, much easier. Uh, both at the primary care level as well as at the specialty level. Uh, and so the payment system has, uh, has rewarded both of us, both the primary care physicians as well as the, spe the traditional specialists. And it's a lot easier to make referrals when you know that, that uh, the insurance is going to pay the bill. In terms of the the collegiality you described. So, you know, I, I certainly have an appreciation for some of the sentiments coming out of specialist, other specialists in the late 60s, and then maybe some hesitancy in interacting with family docs. In, in your community, and, and perhaps at large nationally, uh, at what point did you start to see a shift to where the ideal or the image of a family doc was really more embraced and, and really appreciated with that title? That's a good question, and I can tell you uh, from my point of view here in Lancaster County, uh, the family doc has been fully embraced, fully embraced, Okay. almost from the beginning. And maybe it's because Lancaster County always had a, uh, among its physician population, a significant number of general practitioners, obviously in very pre-World War II, they, it was that was the dominant physician in the community. Excuse me, in the community, and of course, as specialization evolved, uh, I don't know what the uh, differential was, but uh, I I know we, when I came to Lancaster, uh, we had two hundred twenty thousand people, and we we looked at the figures at the time and we had at least one general practitioner for every 3000 people wow well uh, that's that's a significant number but it turns out we needed many more especially now that the payment system changed with medicare and medicaid made it a lot easier for access to to get a physician we now needed uh by the time we were in the late 70s and 80s, we needed one family physician for every 1,500 people. So in the meantime, the population went from 220,000 uh, in 1960 to 270,000. Today we have 540,000 people on Lancaster wow. County. <laughs> so it's, it's been pretty hard to keep up with the, with the demand. But we have hundreds of family physicians in Lancaster County uh, more than half of which are now graduates of this residency program. So the residency program has been a godsend for the community. So we've one really, of the, go ahead. We've really done a great job in meeting in meeting the the demand, and the demand uh, actually at the moment continues to exceed the, the supply, even though half of our graduates stay in Lancaster now when they graduate. I have, and we have thirteen, and we have thirteen graduates. 
So I think one of your sentiments, what you just kind of voiced is, is similar to what I've heard from a number of folks. And that is that one of the achievements through the seventies that was so successful was creating an excellent network of academic medicine and training family physicians, right. And, and it seems that that was kind of one of the, the successes. And I, I, would you agree with that, that across the country, that was a, a, a point of, of, you know, pride for the profession? Oh yeah. Yeah. No question about that. Uh, we, uh, you know, our specialty, I think, you know, the figures, but, uh, I think we now have something like 500 residency programs in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I think when you, when you take into consider primary care, we produce the majority of the primary care physicians in, in the, in the country, even though internal medicine, a lot of people in their internal medicine, the majority of those that go into internal medicine still subspecialize. Yes, yeah. And uh, more and more of those in pediatrics, life, likewise. And in our community, nobody's starving. Everybody is has a work, a lot of work to do, and they have more work than. But they, you know, they're 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 busy. In other words, we, oh, we we're yeah. not in, we're not having a, a an issue of uh, that that uh, doctors are competing with one another in a way that they're worried that somebody's taking their work away from them. They have plenty of work to do. I suspect, I'll tell you, that's a theme that I feel quite daily here is that there is plenty of work and plenty of sick people who need help. And I, you know, I'm feeling that. Yeah. I, I told you I'm only about 10 months into practice myself so far, but my gosh, if there isn't a need and a hunger and an interest for good primary care docs here in, in my community down in Franklin County here. So probably, I mean, yeah. without a doubt, something that's felt across the country. Uh, yeah. I, I would say, and by the way, that doctor that I told you about that. Oh yeah. It's John Brenneman. That was, I was right about John. that. I looked it up. I looked it up. I'm going to ask some of my partners about him. I, I don't know him offhand. If he's still, if he's still practicing, he would be in the seventies. I don't think he is. I, I think yeah. I know all the family docs here in town, and I, I haven't yeah. come across him offhand. John Brenneman. Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to yeah. ask my partner, just to, for if nothing else, just for my own sake, I'd be interested to hear from yeah. him. Um, so, so it sounds like in a lot of ways, um, promoting the profession was successful, training really solid family physicians was successful. As you look back, are there any yeah. thing, achievements – that perhaps you had hoped would have a, a, a better outcome, and you may may have fallen well, short. I think I think what deserves attention, and it was in my commentary to you, is the OB issue. The OB issue is always, in my opinion, Absolutely. Been sort of a um, um, we've never been able to. While I was program director, at least, I never felt that the specialty quite uh, satisfactorily we grappled with how to best prepare our graduates in maternity care. Now, having said what I just said, that, that acknowledges the fact that the vast majority of our graduates don't do obstetrics. That doesn't mean they don't get involved in maternity care, but they don't deliver babies. Uh, I don't know what the figures are now, but when back when I was director of our program, uh, I don't think more nationwide, I don't think more than 10% of our graduates chose to do OB. Now the Lancaster program is a little different, and that's because I think we put First of all, we always had a high maternity volume because of the way the program was structured, uh, and the, the we always and so we always had, I'd say, a minimum of twenty percent overall of our graduates doing obstetrics, and 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 some of them have continued to do that right here in their own community, even though there it, it's it's. Uh, even though there's lack of encouragement to do so by the OP community. They, they still, uh, up until I, uh, the time I retired, there was still uh, a, um, a sense that why are you family?
family doctors delivering babies with all that high risk that's out there. Doesn't make any sense to us why you would do that. Uh, if there's a lawsuit, uh, you're, you're much more vulnerable than we are. Well, it then turns out that that wasn't quite the case. Uh, our, our family doctors, I don't think, have any higher uh, incidence of, uh, of lawsuits against them for, for their maternity side of their practice and then, and then obstetricians, in fact, the obstetricians still continue to have a high rate of lawsuits against them for doing, you know, and because of the nature of obstetrics. Because I think what it comes down to is family doctors, when they have a patient who has high risk, they're going to refer them. Mm-hmm. So having said all of that, there are, we need, in my opinion, I was saying this a long time, we need to re-examine our curriculum. Mm-hmm. There should be there should be a track for those who are going to deliver babies, and there should be a track for those who, who decided they don't want to deliver babies. Why should they have the same delivery experience as uh, you know the one that's not going to deliver babies and the one that's going to have a delivery experience? The, fir- the person who wants to do uh, and tackle high-risk patients needs even more more uh, training, and I've advocated that we develop a certificate of added qualification obstetrics to allow those physicians who want to practice in communities where they have to take on high-risk patients and even have the capability of doing cesarean sections. That requires, in my opinion, uh, uh, additional training and education and experience, and that uh, would that's the argument that I put forward for the certificate of added qualification. So, I- uh, I'm, I'm, you know, to this day, you know, I know this is continues to be debated, and of course, part of the part of the difficulty our specialists had with this is the geographic issues. The people on the east side of the country, uh, in who are, who are doing family practice. Uh, the, the vast, vast majority do not include obstetrics in their practice. Those on the West Coast or the Northwest especially, many more of them do obstetrics. And so it's just different. And I know that the training is a, is a bit different. If you go to a program like in Spokane, Washington, versus a program like ours in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, the OB experience is different in the kind of uh, required skills that they re- that they need to have by, by the time they graduate are different than even in our program, even though we have a high volume OB OB program. I'm, so actually, you just you just hit, I, I think that requires attention. You hit on an area that I'm interested in, and, and I mean not that I mean everything you've said I've been very interested in, but one area that that maybe even a little bit uh, uh, complementary to this discussion is just those those changes that are ex- uh, observed between different regions of the country. And what I heard you encapsulate in just a couple of sentences was training is a little bit different regionally. The curriculum thus is a little different. But then do you think there's also some element of attitude in terms of the, the culture of the health systems in those regions and the way patient populations and access play out? Is this really a training a paradigm where, where we see regional differences, or is it kind of those three things that are that are mixed together? Well, I can tell you that I had a unique opportunity to address your question because I was a RAP consultant. You know what that is? The residency assisting program, RAP, uh, the resident assistance program, con- consultation program. Do you know about that? I, it sounds familiar. It's not something I don't okay, really know a lot about. The MAP program was established by Tom Stern back in 1975. Uh, the, the reason for the for the for creating the RAP program was because uh, people like Tom felt that there was too much variation in the quality of our residency programs, and he uh, brought together a team of seasoned family physicians, including people like myself, and we put together what would constitute a program of excellence. So uh, those residency programs which sought a consultation would get feedback by our program, 
what they considered to be the qualifications for a program of excellence. And uh, we, each, each one of us RAP consultants, would do about two of these consultations a year. And, they, and we would be sent to different parts of the country. So I have had the opportunity to, to examine different attitudes that, that, were, that affected the, the quality of a program. And all, a lot of those issues, we, we, a lot, the most important curriculum issue, I would say, all, almost all the time was the obstetrical issue. Interesting. Uh, and, you know, obstetricians who are called upon to help train and educate our residents really had a lot of experience. That's why, about, about doing that, that's why you'll see in the last maybe 15 years, 20 years, I know we started doing it 25 years ago, uh, we, we didn't want the primary teacher of obstetrics to be an obstetrician. We wanted it to be our faculty. Yes. So starting about 25, 30 years ago, we started making sure that on the floor, when our residents were going to be delivering a baby, that it was one of our faculty that was the primary teacher. So that they weren't discouraged in any way about doing what they were doing, that they got all the encouragement needed. When I went around the country and I watched other residency programs that didn't have that kind of a structure, uh, no wonder so many of them decided I'm not going to touch it and will be patient when I leave this residency program. And that was particularly common on the East Coast. And that's... Uh, but it was also common in various parts of the South as well. And so part of that is probably an attitudinal component, sure. I suspect, right? Sure. Interesting. And another issue that, uh, that bears some discussion before our interview is up today and that is the patient-centered medical. Uh, I, I knew it was coming. I, I was going to ask you about any areas of, of kind of refocusing for the profession. And I know that had been something you had um, addressed pretty extensively in your in your written comments. I would yeah, love for you to sh share where you think um, that – share with your thoughts about that. I'd appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, it, I, I, you know, fundamentally, I think it was driven by the payment system. Uh, we were looking at the American County Transitions, I think, were looking at ways to convince the third party system why we should be rewarded for the work that we do. Uh, and, and, uh, and we needed to prove to them that the kind of work that we do deserves better recognition by the payers. And they came up with these patient center medical home concept. And if you meet uh, certain qualifications that puts you in a in an attractive position to be paid better. And with the electronic medical record, we can prove uh, much of what we do uh, in terms of quality outcomes. So I think that it was driven by the fact we now have the electronic medical record, this new technology that allows us to critically evaluate our practices and individuals who practice within that those practices and and it, it allows us also to measure quality outcomes, whether it's improving the way we care for our chronic patients with chronic illness, such as diabetes, hypertension, uh, disorders with, uh, that include uh, coronary eye disease with hypercholesterolemia being factors and so forth, and we can measure how well we're doing with such uh, outcomes. And, and and so we're rewarded, but it's still, if you look at, as I pointed out in my, I, I went back to the, to the, uh, uh, to the academy's uh, statements about what is patient-centered medical, here, what is patient-centered medical home, and it, it incorporates all the fundamental principles that have always been part of family medicine. Access, for example, uh -huh. the whole person orientation, for example. The, 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 the coordinated, coordinated care concept, for example. And even though we may not have pushed it as hard as we, we now do, the team idea has always been a part of how we deliver uh, good patient care, especially when we start 
developing group, working within group practices. Mm -hmm. And especially since we've adopted and integrated the, the physician assistant and nurse practitioner into our system. Uh, so the team idea is a good one, uh, but what, what I, I, I guess when it, when it was first promoted, I was sort of wondering, what is this, another <laughs> acronym that is going to uh, change the way who we are? And the answer is, it doesn't change who we are. Uh, all it is is adopting, trying to develop a, uh, a way of convincing the pairs that how valuable we are to the system. And then, uh, interestingly enough, the other special things have adopted the same idea. Yep. So, and, and if you look at if you look at incomes of family physicians, now it's really changed dramatically in the last ten years. The things that really have changed in that regards. I don't think you can say that family physicians are not paid paid well anymore. They are paid well. I would agree, and and I think yeah. what I'm hearing from you is that the PCMH was meant to try to prove that value. And it sounds like in a way, it may not have necessarily shifted the needle that the, that just us continuing to do the yeah. things we do probably would have led to better payments either way. And the PCMH yeah. really may, to be honest, have gotten in the way of that a little bit. And the other thing along the same lines, and that's what I was telling you when you, in your, in your email, in your questions about what should the family medicine be focusing on more as we go forward. And I think the cost of medical care mm -hmm. has become so prohibitive. For so, I mean, you, if you don't have insurance, forget it. Yep. You can't get good care. Uh, and feel free to answer. I'm if saying, you need to answer that, feel free. No, no. It's a, let me see. I think it's a solicitation. It's this kind of day for solicitation calls. Yep, that's what it is. It's a solicitation call. They always get you around lunch hour. So, what I'm going to say to you is that we, we have to refocus our, our attention on developing ways to decrease cost of care. I mean, obviously, the electronic medical record can be used to our advantage because uh, if a patient's already had an MRI for their back, uh, and it goes to a specialist for referral two years later, you know, they should have to make a pretty strong argument why they need to have another MRI if, if the symptoms are the same. It's just the patient's just not getting better. Yep. You know, uh, but that kind of thing, and we have to be an advocate to try to find ways to decrease costs. And we, with our global perspective and kind of the, the opportunity to see patients as they move through the system, I mean, we really are, we have an opportunity to be the advocates for that. Um, I hope we aren't ever framed as the bad guys for it, you know, trying to, you know, prevent a uh, specialist from ordering anything. But you're right, I think we should be positioned. But, to... even, but even ourselves, I keep telling the resident, don't order any tests unless you're going to do something with the results. You know, we order tests, you know, somebody's cholesterol. Do they need a yearly check when their, nor their cholesterol numbers are good? Do they really? I don't think so. I, uh, I totally uh, agree. Uh, if, you're, if you're not going to do anything with the results, then why order the test? Just to reassure the patient that their, their numbers are where they're supposed to be? You know darn well they're going to be pretty close to it. Plus, now, now that we've changed our guidelines, too, you know, we're... You know, we, we, uh, yeah, anyway, we just, here's another piece of mind. Yeah. We have, we have gotten obsessed with the wish, to, with the word quality. I think quality is a good, is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. But I think we've gone overboard. Uh, give you, uh, yeah, we, we spent too much money to make little differences in our patient's outcomes. Whether it's a test or whether it's uh, medication, uh, uh, you know, I'll give you one, I guess a good example that I 
years when I'm precepting. Patient comes in, and on clinical examination, they have a strep throat. They have a strep throat. They have the exit date of toxolitis. They have the cervical, tender cervical adenopathy. They may even come in with some complaints of abdominal cramping. They have the fever that chills, and they don't have a cough. They don't have congestion. They just have a sore throat, and they have everything to support them on clinical grounds. Why do you need a throat culture? Totally throat agree. Throat culture back negative. Now what are you going to do? Yep. You were ready to treat them. You sometimes treat them anyway. Yep. So why did you order the <laughs> test? I've seen that. I've seen a lot of that yeah. negative strep test, but I'm still worried about it, so I'm going to treat him anyways. Well, <laughs> yeah, so don't, don't put yourself in that bind. Uh, and on and on and on it goes. I mean, there are many examples of that sort. Uh, but or the word I like, by the way, instead of quality, I, I like the word value. Value. Value equals Q over C. Yep. Value equals Q over C. Q is quality, and C is cost. Yep. But there's no question that we have to keep quality in our minds at all talk, at all times. But if the cost exceeds, far exceeds the quality outcome that you're looking for, then it loses value. And our our specialty needs to put more. Give, give much more attention to the word value. And keeping in mind that quality should not be diminished, but not when it's at an excessive cost. I, I think you and I have an awful lot to talk about, and I think we see eye to eye in an awful lot as well. Good. Um, I, I wanted to, um, to kind of uh, summarize a little bit of what we've talked about, um, and certainly... The, the primary focus of what Larry and I have been looking at uh, are the dreams of the founders. And, and what I heard from you um, uh, uh, when we spoke earlier this week was really that, that the primary driver was not only to define a specialty for which um, communities and families and patients could develop a relationship, but also to meet access issues. And, uh, and oh, yeah. I, I think... You know, the interesting thing is, as we talk now, we say, well, you know, that's still such a big problem. You know, that's still nothing. You know, we've created this specialty and, and we have 500 residencies uh, and we still struggle to meet the needs of the, the communities that we serve. And I, I think that's I don't know if there's a good answer there. I'm not sure how to respond to that. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know if it was a question. That might have more been a statement than yeah. anything else. But I just, yeah, that was one of the things that I think you articulated quite well when we spoke before was that this was an issue of meeting meeting needs. You know, meeting well, how does a general practitioner learn uh, or, or transition in order to care for for patients in a different way and, and provide access for all levels of a community. Um, and I don't know. It, I, I think we've done a pretty good job with that, really. I think we have. And, you know, that takes into consideration that we should know how to use our specialist colleagues. And in Lancaster County, I think we, we, we do know how to do that. And a part of it is because of the nature of the training, once again. The residents go through a, a wonderful training experience. Not only do they acquire the skills, the added skills to take care of a difficult pediatric patient or a cardiology patient or a rheumatologic patient. But they also know how to use those rheumatologists for the advantage of the patient. It's always for the advantage of the patient. I, I think we've done pretty good on that score. At least that's my experience here in Lancaster County. I have to tell you, one of, the, one of my favorite moments in all of, of medicine for myself was I, I worked, I did my training down at Duke and I worked with one of the cardiologists who had been a, a, one of the lead researchers on the Duke criteria for endocarditis. Yeah. Yeah. And and our team was just he and I. So the, the our, our cardiology service was him as an attending and me as an intern. And we sat down one day and we were seeing patients and this and that. And at the end of the day, he said, you know, Aaron, I have to tell you, I don't know how you went into family medicine and how you do what you do, 
I could not respect family doctors anymore, and the work that you do is so hard, I don't know if I could ever do it. Um, it is hard. And, and it he, is hard. he meant it very complimentary, and I, I took that as, yeah. as a level of respect, um, you know, from someone who probably is, you know, a world-renowned researcher, to say, you know, as a family doc, I really respect what you're doing. And I thought that really hit me pretty hard. I thought that was that was quite telling yeah. for me early in my career as I was an intern. Um, I guess I I, um, I have patients here in just another couple of minutes back in the clinic. Yes, I know. I appreciate sharing the lunch hour with you, and I, I certainly appreciate your time, your flexibility, <coughs> your willingness to accept. Um, I'm normally, I, I consider myself a pretty organized person, and I feel like for whatever reason, the last week, um, I, I've been, uh, yeah, I knew, we, we, you, you've been we, wonderfully we, we flexible. Got <laughs> I, I got married and she started intern year and, um, and you know, I'm settling back in. So I thank you for your willingness to work around my schedule. And I guess I'd like to just leave the last question of this interview open and say, are there any <clears throat> thoughts or questions that I didn't ask that you think would be important for knowing about the dreams of our founders? Yeah, I think you've done a good job, and I applaud you for taking the time to to engage in this project. And I have one question for you. Where is your wife during your residency? So she is down at Portsmouth Naval Hospital uh, in Portsmouth, Virginia. Uh -huh. And uh, unfortunately, as you know, as the match is an, an era of mystery, we had hoped she would be at York or Hershey, um, but unfortunately she was essentially, you know, found her assignment was, was Portsmouth. So we're, we're doing our best to make things work on the weekends and, and, uh, and yeah. we're about two weeks in. So that's the other reason between travel, we're trying to figure out how that works out too. So well, I, I wish you well, I thank you for that. I, my suspicion is not only will you and I meet, but we'll cross paths down the road with Taylor as well. Um, she's, I'm sure she, that. she loves organized medicine. She's, she's fell in with both the North Carolina Academy of Family Docs and both, and the Pennsylvania Academy as well. So she, I think between the three of us, we have a lot of mutual friends. Um, <laughs> hey, Great. so I, I've got to ask you a question. Well, I'll share with this just to, to close the interview part particularly. What will come after this is Larry Bauer and I are putting together a brief piece, a uh, perspective piece that we're thinking about interest, some interest in contributing to the 50th anniversary of STFM. Um, uh -huh. Before any words are submitted, um, I, I will be in touch with you with some summary notes on our call and and by all means I would I would want to have any reflection or feedback from you before using your voice in any way um, but I, but I can assure you that I'll, I'll be in touch with you before anything moves forward and then we're just looking at saying you had given me a tremendous list of names and, and Larry and I reviewed every single name you had you had come across we, we spoke for about an hour uh, two nights ago and and we're in the process of actively reaching out to as many of the 30 or 40 or 50 different founders and followers that we can. And we just thought this was an opportunity to really capture those collective voices and paint a picture for the early dreams and, and years of the of family medicine as a specialty. And so I expect, yeah, and hope, I really hope this will expand beyond just this call and, and just, I, I certainly more than just a perspective article. I hope that this develops into something more, but we're just, we just figured this is a good opportunity to sit down and collect all of these stories and thoughts and perspectives in one place. Um, and the, I guess the, the fun question I had for you is, is this cruise to the Isle of Kos going to happen? <laughs> Are, well, it's up to you guys. <laughs> I, I heard your, so your family's from there, correct? Yes, that's right. Oh. The island, the island of Pocket I would move heaven and earth to make it to be a part of that trip. So <laughs> if it's going to happen... Well, that's, I, that's up to Larry and the, board, and the board. I'll fight like heck, and if you guys need any help in the planning or organizing or arranging, yes. um, without well, a doubt, you can count on me. Listen, I, I remember Tom's last name. Oh, yeah. The, the founding director of New York, Tom Hart. Tom Hart. It's a Tom name Hart. I haven't heard. Yeah, and, 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 the, and, the, and the Family Practice Center at York is also named after him. It's, uh, it's named after Tom Hart. Okay. Anyway, he was another one of those illustrious guys that is no longer with us, but did a lot to help shape the specialty. Well, I've got, I've got a lot of homework to do based on the names you've passed on, so I, I really appreciate your thoughts, your time, and I look forward to us uh, meeting again soon. 
I, I look forward to it also. All right. Hey, take care. Take care. Hey, goodbye. All right. Bye.